Imagine getting lost in 3,000 miles of mountainous wilds full of hungry bears, angry moose, and freezing snowy peaks. But sometimes those aren't the worst things you may encounter out there. Because in the Rockies, some very terrifying things lurk. These allegedly true scary stories from the Rocky Mountains will show you just that. Enjoy these stories and be sure to send me your creepy experiences at darkstories.org. I'd love to hear stories from the Sierra Nevada and from anyone who works outdoors. Follow the Darkness Prevails podcast on Spotify and iTunes if you'd rather listen hands-free. Now, let's begin. Bad Encounter in the Rockies From Marcus My two friends, Joanne, Jordy, and I we're hiking outside of Bonf National Park. We were going up some mountain that belonged to the Rockies. I don't really remember which. We're all experienced outdoors. There was a little bit of snow underfoot at the time, but it was sunny and bright out. The mountain was real short, yeah, and we were aiming to set up a sleeping area on top. There, it was plateaued and flat enough to chill out for a night, but still high with a pretty view. We were probably a hundred feet up the mountain when stuff started to seem out of the ordinary. I noticed that the trail had these deep gouges in it, going like a foot or two down into the earth. They were pretty wide too. There were four or five of them consecutively, and then they stopped. I asked my friends what they were. They just shook their heads. My best guess at the time was some sort of animal dug it out. But they were really big. Seemed dumb a bear would waste that much energy for something so pointless, and I couldn't think of anything else that had the size or power to do it. Plus, these markings must have been new, too, because there was no snow at the bottom of them, despite the path being blanketed in it. Whatever. We kept on going. As we went up the mountain, we saw more and more of these gouges, like every ten meters up the trail. Given their frequency, we thought they may have been natural or part of some development process. But erosion didn't work like that. And what would park workers be doing all the way up here? The markings seemed to be too random to be man-made. Then we began to pick up on this smell. I don't know how to describe it other than mold. It smelled like mildew. Yeah, back when I lived with my parents, our house got flooded. The basement, anyway. The odor was sort of like that, really damp and musky. Jordy could really smell it, and boy was he complaining. But he was right. The smell didn't belong up on a mountain. It made no sense. We were hiking for twenty more minutes when the smell faded. So did the weird dugouts in the dirt. Stuff was back to normal, pretty much. The sun was starting to hit the horizon, so we picked up the pace a little. Keep in mind, we had big packs filled with food, water, and our sleeping bags, so we were going kind of slow still. After a while, close to 700 feet up the small mountain, we made it to the area we were going to set up camp at. Once again, though, the mildewy smell seemed to return, like it was waiting for us, and again we found one of those weird holes. This time, it was a lot bigger. Circular. It sat right in the middle of the plateau. The only reason we thought it was related to the ones from before was because there was no snow inside, telling us it had to have been made recently. It wasn't too cold up on the top. The mountain ranged up, connecting to others. Just next to the plateau, there was a forest that climbed the ever taller range of the Rockies. Because of the trees, there really wasn't much wind or anything. But Jordy and Joanne still went into the stretch of woods to grab material for a fire. It was late autumn after all. You should note that the two were a couple, so when they took a little bit to return, I wasn't concerned. I was still just focused on setting up the campsite. Normally, we'd construct a pit with a few stones to line the fire and reflect the heat, but this time I didn't bother. I thought the strange dugout in the middle of the plateau would serve as a perfect fire pit. My friends finally came back, both with their hands full of kindling and logs, 
something I noticed was that Joanne was real quiet. Ordinarily, she'd be telling jokes or something, but she wasn't speaking at all. When we piled the wood into the pit, I realized the mildew smell had gotten stronger. I asked them if they could smell it too, and Jordy said yes. He mentioned it was darn strong in the forest. I then supposed it was the pieces of wood they brought back. Maybe it was rotted or something. But no, the fire burned great. The strange hole was honestly perfect for it. We heated our food, and it was fine. We could still smell the mold even over the fire, but it wasn't a huge issue. The sun set, but we were still cozy in our insulated sleeping bags. I think we went to bed around nine. Joanne was obviously upset about something. She barely said a word that night. Sometime later, I woke up to shuffling. I sat up in my sleeping bag. The fire was out, so I grabbed my phone and turned on the light. To my surprise, both my friends were gone. I got up, slipping on my boots. I was still fully dressed because of where we were. I called out their names and I kept shining the phone around the campsite. Their sleeping bags were still there, but they were empty. But their shoes were gone. Their backpacks weren't, though. After a minute or two of calling, Jordy suddenly ran out of the woods back into the campsite. He was out of breath and panicked. He shouted, Joanne's gone! I was confused. A pit started to form in my stomach. What do you mean? Where? Jordy told me that he had awakened to find Joanne staring at him, standing directly over him, breathing heavily. He asked her if something was wrong. She smiled, and that's when she spoke, but it was like she was using a different language because he couldn't understand it. She then took off into the woods bordering the campsite. He did his best to keep up with her, but he couldn't manage. When he heard me calling, he came back to camp. I relit the fire because stuff didn't feel right, and I wanted as much light as possible. Then we took the larger flashlights we had in our bags and headed into the woods in hopes of finding her. Something really wasn't making sense, though. Jordy was too caught up in adrenaline worried about his girl, and I was too, to an extent. Still, I couldn't help thinking about how the whole situation was botched. Why the heck would she run into the woods pitch black like that? And the stuff about the words he couldn't understand, it was freaking me out. Above that, though, as we entered the forest, the smell of mildew was incredibly strong. It added to my queasiness. It clung to the air like it was a perfume sprayed just a few seconds ago. We were about 20 feet in, still walking quickly. We were calling her name, shining our lights around like mad. And then, she responds. Over here. Over here. It sounded like she was close by, off to our left. I shined the light over there, but didn't see anything. Jordy follows up with his light, but we still don't see smack. Keep in mind the moldy smell is still strong, overpowering almost. Then Joanne called to us again, only this time she was on the other side of us the complete other direction. We both glanced at each other, wondering how the heck she was able to do that. We shined our lights again, and who would have guessed? Nothing was there. It felt as if we were being played with. This went on for maybe three minutes. Joanne would keep taunting us from different areas of the woods, and we'd look, but no one would be there. Jordy got real fed up, cursing at her to stop playing. At one point, he ran to where he heard the voice, and still we didn't see a glimpse of her. After that, everything changed. There was this big whoosh sound, like a giant gust of air just blew through the entire forest, and then this laughing started. It sounded like Joanne at first, only we couldn't tell what direction it was coming from. It was as if it was coming from all around us, to this day, I've never experienced anything like it. A few seconds in, it changed from Joanne's voice. It was like the second voice picked up, deep and throaty. 
<laughs> it was really strained. You could almost call it masculine. But it was more animal than human. They were both laughing in unison before it picked up into a scream. It was ear-splitting, like a horse and a girl screaming together from every single direction. So me and Jordy booked it. The only reason we knew which way to go was because of the fire. We sprinted right back into the camp, and as soon as we got out of the tree line, it stopped. It was there one minute and gone the next. We were freaking out. Joanne was still in the woods. Some real bad stuff was going on. We were up on a mountain in the middle of nowhere and it was pitch black outside. We just sat behind the fire, trying to think of something. We didn't even bother trying to rationalize it. We were both terrified. After a few minutes, Jordy manned up. He grabbed the little hunting knife he had in his backpack. It wasn't big enough to ward off a coyote, let alone whatever the heck that thing screaming at us was, but he wanted to get Joanne. So I followed him. I don't even know what we were thinking. We strutted back up to the forest, him with his knife, me with my flashlight, preparing for some duel of legend with whatever the heck had been messing with us. The moldy odor stunk so bad as we walked back up to the woods. The air got tenser and tenser, and finally, just as we were going to enter the tree line, Jordy? It was Joanne's voice again. I shined the light to where I heard it, not expecting to see anything. But, to our relief, there she was. She was dirty and freezing. All she had on was her inner layers. Her jacket and cargo pants and boots were missing. She walked out of the woods to us, hugging her boyfriend. And he was all, What the heck happened? Why were you messing around in the woods? Where are your clothes? She couldn't answer at all, like she had no memory of it. So we brought her back to camp, and I gave her the other jacket I had in my bag. All things considered, she seemed okay. We talked it out, and she didn't remember anything. The last thing she recalled was her and Jordy going into the woods to grab some firewood. She said she thought she heard his voice from up a little way and walked over. But that's it. The next thing she knew, she woke up in the woods in the middle of the night and she saw us with the flashlight and called out to us. She didn't remember the cat and mouse game or the laughing, screaming stuff. And she was totally sure she never went back to camp. Never had dinner with us. She proved it too, she was starving, and ate almost all the rest of the food we had packed. The rest of the night we took turns standing guard. I worked most of the night as my friends slept. I kept the fire burning brighter than the sun, let me tell ya. Nothing weird happened. The only thing was I kept hearing branches snap out in the trees. No screaming though, no weird figures, nothing too bad. I went to bed around three when Jordy got back up to keep watch. I slept a few hours. As soon as it was dawn and we had the tiniest amount of daylight to work with, we booked it back down the mountain. We were all so tired, and the hike was really awkward for Joanne because she had to make do with a pair of running shoes. But we made it down. I can't say for sure what happened that night. Maybe Joanne was possessed, or maybe it wasn't even her at all. All I can think of is how quiet and alien she seemed to us that night as she ate and hung around the fire with us. There's one last note I'll end it on. When everything was settled and we were back at the hotel we were staying at before the hike, Jordy told me that during his watch, he was about to nod off when movement caught his eye. He focused. And just at the edge of the trees, right beyond the light of the fire, he saw Joanne. She was waving at him. It was what looked like Joanne anyway, but the Joanne we had found was in her sleeping bag right by his feet. As he turned to confirm she was still sleeping, he looked back up and into the woods, but whoever, whatever it was, had vanished. Gone, without a trace. By the way he put it, it almost felt as if he was messing with me. 
but I can't be sure. Warakin around Glacier Lake from Bilbo, 1776. As a younger man, I enjoyed hiking through many of the surrounding mountains of Montana that I grew up close to. The Beartooth Mountains are just one of the many segments to the Rocky Mountains, known for the massive peak in the middle of the range that looks like a giant bear's tooth. I was 16 when I and a few friends of mine decided to take a week and go for a bit of backpacking excursion to Glacier Lake and hike all the way back to Sheep and Goat Lakes. There were four of us. I will call the brothers Little G and Big G, as both names of course start with G's, and my other friend M. We all had our army surplus backpacking setups, a one-man canvas army tent, our big backpacks that carried everything from MREs to our clean socks and underwear, all amounting to about 25 pounds of food and clothing for each of us, save for me who had the cooking equipment. The first day went very well. It was the perfect time of year to take our time picking some sweet currant and huckleberries while we hiked. The trail going up the mountain is rather steep, a few hours later, we made it the four and a half miles to the first lake. We decided to set up camp off the beaten path to the north side of the lake. We looked around for a bit, finding a good space that was relatively flat. We pitched our tents as the sun dipped behind the mountain, and the whole valley behind us grew dark in its shadow. That night we broke out our favorite MREs, mine being chilly with beans. We decided to finally turn in after stoking the fire high and making sure to store our food packs in a tree. Little G said he would stay up for a bit. He wanted to make himself a walking staff out of a straight branch he had found. That night, I believe around 3am, I woke up to a branch breaking. I listened for a moment, but I didn't hear anything. I then realized I had to pee really bad. Promptly, I extracted myself from the small tent, and forgetting about the sound that woke me, I stepped just past the tree line around the camp. Now that I was possibly in the most compromising position a guy can be in, and after the relief rushed over me, I immediately felt like I was being watched. I quickly finished up and backtracked real fast to the camp. Getting back into camp, I threw a new log on the fire, all while looking around me. I still just felt as if something was off. Little G had fallen asleep next to the fire and woke up when I put the log in. He looked at me a little bit funny, then promptly fell back to sleep, using his pack as a pillow. I thought about fully waking him, but I felt too darn silly, thinking I was just spooking myself. The fire began to blaze back to life and lit up the surrounding area well at this point. I sat down, my back to my tent and added another log. I reached into my pack, checking for my pistol, berating myself for not just strapping the thing on at the start of the hike. Feeling more safe and confident with the fire now alive and well, and my pistol at my side, I slowly fell back into slumber. I awoke with the light of the sun just starting to blanket the landscape. Sitting up and looking around, adding a log to the fire pit, Hoping some coals were left to restart it, I froze. I had caught something in the dim light, just outside the camp, moving in the underbrush. I slowly looked up, searching and straining my eyes, seemingly materializing out of the shadows I see a mostly featureless large animal creeping through the trees. I grab my truck keys, which have a small light on the chain, and click it on, searching for my headlamp with my hand in my pack. The small keychain LED light did not do much to reveal the features of the creature, other than to reveal that it was a dark furred animal, and all I saw was what I believed to be the back legs of it, before it suddenly disappeared behind some brush. I found my headlamp and put it on, and with it lit up, I looked and now saw nothing. I walked to the edge of camp, looking in the trees and underbrush and seeing nothing. I woke up little G, telling him what just happened. In a few minutes with more sunlight reaching the area, and everyone waking up, we discussed what it might be, and just reaffirmed that no one was to go away from the group. Most animals never would attack a group of people, 
especially if the animal was on their own. The next two days went by without a problem. We hiked, we fished, set up camp, slept well, only now we had a watchman. The third night came about and it was my turn to take the first three hours of the night watch. We had gathered far more wood since the first night, so we could keep the fire going without needing to search for more. I settled in and began stripping the bark from a stick I'd found to keep myself busy, throwing the kindling into a pile as the night slowly went on. About two hours into my watch, around ten o'clock, I hear once again the snapping of a twig. I turn towards the sound, flipping on my headlamp. There was nothing there again. I scanned the rest of the surrounding forest in the trees and towards the underbrush and then sat back down. The rest of the watch went smoothly, not hearing or seeing anything else. I traded out with Big G and told him what I'd heard. I fell asleep quickly and woke up to the sunlight bathing the land. Another day of exploring around Goat and Sheep Lake and beginning a longer trek back to Glacier Lake, all of which was uneventful outside of seeing some other wildlife like a group of mountain sheep far off on the side of a taller mountain and some rock chucks. That night, however, would change that. That night, I had second watch from 11 to 2 a.m. M had the first watch and had not seen anything, and by the time he was already asleep, it must have been about 12. I was sharpening my knife as it had dulled for my nights of turning sticks into kindling, the scrape of my wet stone was loud in the relatively quiet forest. Crickets chirped, some cicadas were making their noise. Then, some of that noise went silent. Not all of it, as I could still hear the cicadas thrumming away. I didn't think much of it, just looked around for a minute and went back to my sharpening. A few minutes later, I look up to find eyes on me. Eyes that were hungry. Eyes I had never looked into the likes of before. Quickly, I went for my pistol, dropping my sharpening stone and gripping my knife in a ready-to-stab stance. This creature was weird. It was like some kind of dog-wolf, large yet shaped a bit like a buffalo, with the front legs and shoulder bigger and longer, and the back legs shorter. The head was like an elongated egg shape, almost like that of an English bull terrier, only slimmer to the tip but the whole animal had long, pitch-black hair at its back that faded to gray, and then a deep red-orange under its head to its chest, and larger than any wolf I'd ever seen in pictures. We sat there for what seemed like an age, staring each other down, me with the intent to only shoot if it moved closer, and its amber eyes looking into me letting me know it saw me like a juicy steak, as the firelight slowly dimmed away to coals. I finally dared to move and kicked another log over to the fire, a few sparks flying keeping my eyes on the beast. It also decided to begin to move then, pacing shortly around the left side of the fire but not getting closer. It growled then, and what a sound. It both put fear into the air and sounded like a purr. Even with the deep gurgle one would expect from such a big creature, for a moment I wondered if I had made a mistake in not shooting first and asking questions later, and that's when it lurched towards me. I instinctively leapt over the fire to the opposite side as it came closer, and I pulled the trigger, and somewhat disjointedly I heard myself yelling like a madman. <laughs> a very weird sound reverberated through the air then, and a bit of a sick feeling rolled over me. It had been a good shot, at least to the point that it had hit the animal, and it made the sound of a surprised, twisted scream of a child mixed with a dog in pain. <sighs> it then bolted away and was gone. About this time I turned to look, and found that two of the three others had pretty much ripped themselves out of their tents and Big G was struggling with extracting themselves in a panic from a sleeping bag like their lives depended on it, all of them cursing and looking at me like I was a crazed lunatic, questioning away about what the heck that was. I turned, ignoring them, looking with my headlamp around the forest frantically, but it was gone. 
I finally got them all to be quiet by yelling, Shut up! I took one more look through the brush and forest around us. Looking to where I'd aimed to shoot, I found no blood. There was, however, a great amount of pine needles and dirt scattered everywhere, as though something had torn at the ground to leap away with all the force it had. Claw marks dug in deeply. The others joined me in looking at the spot, returning to their questioning but more subdued. After telling them what I saw, we were all up the rest of the night. We packed up camp as soon as the dawn began to light up the area, and we left that mountain. We reported the account to a forest ranger I knew, and we never heard more about it. He said he didn't know what it could have been, other than some wild dog. But through my own research, I have a feeling we had been followed for days by a very well-fed Shunka Warakin, a wild wolfhound species that many natives spoke of in their folklore, the translation being, carrying off dogs as this creature apparently specialized in the old days in coming into native camps and taking their dogs for a meal. I wouldn't say this creature that is still classified as a cryptid, even though evidence has been clearly found of its existence, is any more dangerous than a wolf, though in my opinion it looks far more frightening. I hope this is a reminder for everyone. Keep your friends close and a gun closer. Stay in groups when adventuring in the wilderness. We, after all, aren't always at the top of the food chain, without our numbers and technology. Chased in the Rockies From A Piece of Pie The story I'm about to tell you takes place from 1995 to 1998. When I was a teen, it was a traumatic time for me. I don't talk about it much. Me, my mom, and her new husband had just moved to a nice cabin in the Rockies, so it was secluded and big. We had two neighbors down the dirt road, but other than that, it was private. It was the only good thing about this time in my life. I could take a walk and forget about leaving my home in Denver with all my friends, just to live with my stepdad, who at the time I hated, even though he tried to connect with me as a father figure. I didn't care, though. I was angry and mad that I didn't have a say in any of this. After a few months, I got used to things. I did start to like the place, and every morning before school, I would take walks around the place, admiring its beauty. However, one night I was heading back from an after-school walk, when I heard someone say my name. Johnny, come here. It was like my mom's voice, but distorted. I wasn't far from the cabins, so I assumed maybe she was calling out for me, and it just sounded weird. So I rushed home, but once the house was in view, I stopped. I noticed the sound was still going, and it was angry now. Johnny, come here now. I knew then that the voice was not my mom's. It was too loud and strange. Just then, I could have sworn I heard crunching leaves behind me, but by the time I turned around, nothing was there. I ran off quickly. When I made it home, just in case, I asked my mom if she was yelling my name, but she said no. After that, I was shaken up enough and decided to not go too far on my walks for a while. A few weeks later, I began to explain away the incident. I soon felt brave enough to start walking my usual path again. Of course, this time I brought a large stick with me, and I would walk with my friend Brock, who lived down the road, as often as I could. One day we were walking on the weekend. We were talking about school and hunting when we began to hear whispers. This frightened us, so we ran the rest of the way. We spent the rest of the evening playing my new PlayStation. Brock would be sleeping over. At dinner time, we started to eat dinner in the dining room. My dad was running late from work, so we ate without him. At one point, Brock whispered to me, So are we going to talk about those whispers? My mom overheard, so we had to explain to her about these whispers we heard. When we were done, she seemed concerned, but we didn't talk about it. Soon we saw my dad's truck pull in. When he got out, I heard him say hello to me. The funny thing is, I wasn't even out there. I was confused. 
When he came inside and saw me, his heart dropped. He looked at me and looked at the door and opened it and screamed. He explained that he saw a figure at the basketball hoop in our front yard, and he thought it was me. He was very much shaken up about it. When I looked out there again, I saw it running away, he explained. He ended up keeping watch of the woods for a while with his rifle, and he even called the neighbors and Brock's parents to watch out. We went to bed, except for my stepdad who stayed up with his rifle. Later in life, he told me what he saw. These were his exact words. Around twelve, I saw the thing. It was tall and skinny with hollow black eyes. I, I aimed my gun at it. I thought about firing, but by the time I lined up the shot, it was gone. A few times I would hear it calling for me, saying my name. My mom later admitted she would hear the same thing, hers and my dad's names being called. It stopped after a few months, then went back again. After a while, I realized it would do it for the first two weeks in a month. So for those four months, every week, I didn't go for walks. In 1998, I was heading for college soon. My stepdad, who I'd finally liked now, was working in the garage. It was getting late. It was the last week of February, so I assumed that thing was away at the moment hunting or whatever it does. My dad said to me, Hey, can you hand me the bolts? I handed them to him. He was working on my mom's car, swearing and cursing at it. I helped him until we heard a knock on the garage door. Then something on the other side called our names loudly. My dad, in a hurry, yelled at it and told me, Get the guns now. I quickly went to retrieve the guns. We made sure they were loaded and ready. We ran out the front door to surprise it. In the dark, I saw it. There was no fur on it. It was skinny and bony, and it looked at us. We fired, but I missed, probably from shaking so much. It ran away, though, and we pursued it into the forest. We chased it, firing at it but never hitting it. We kept going until we couldn't see it anymore and by then it was very dark. Then, suddenly, I heard, Johnny! Johnny! We ran home. It tried to trap us by making us follow its voice, but I saw it running after us, and my dad fired at it again. I think we hit it this time. The thing slowed down enough for us to get away. When home, we explained what happened to my mother who nearly had a heart attack when she had heard the gunshots and screaming. Later on, when we were cleaning our guns, my dad made a joke about it, trying to calm the tension. I miss him. He made things better. I wish I was grateful for him sooner. He was the first father figure I had. When he passed away in 2012, my mom sold the place and moved back to Denver. I visit her still. We don't talk about that thing anymore, but we do talk about my dad. I miss him so much, but one thing I don't miss was that place. I'll always remember the horror of living there.